and welcome to our show. We're so glad you joined us today. This is Angie. And I'm Darlene Pickford. I'm Greg Bauer, and of course we've got our little friend Wicket here, Mr. Excitement as we like to call him. <laughs> and uh, we'd like to tell our viewers about a couple of upcoming shows, one on controlling fleas and ticks. Ooh. Never a problem for anybody, no. I'm sure, but we've got some thoughts on that. <laughs> and also we're going to explore the topic of a backyard habitat, and I think our viewers will really enjoy that. But Darlene, what do we got on tap for today? Oh. I think this looks like a great one. Oh, we have something so very special. We want our viewers to get paper and pencil because we'll be giving you a lot of websites, telephone numbers, and information about animals in the Native American culture. All right. Yes. So, okay. please introduce our guest, Greg. I'll be more than happy to. Uh, at the other end of the table, we have uh, Geraldine Ann Marshall. Um, we call her Jerry. Jerry. <laughs> and she is a program specialist at Wycliffe Mounds State Historical Park. Uh, out in Wycliffe, Kentucky, just west of Paducah here. So, Jerry, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to visit with us today. You're welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Jerry, you're also uh, quite a uh, writer and a storyteller, right? That's right. Uh huh. And that, that's where you've gotten this background into animals in the Native American culture. Right. I have a degree in zoology and I also do a lot of study with the Native American cultures and so that all kind of combines. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, I know in talking to you, Greg, before Greg and I were just uh, really intrigued with the creation stories. I had seen the the world on the back of a turtle, but I never knew what it meant. Okay. Explain that to us. Okay. <laughs> well, in, in a number of, and there's, of course, many uh, uh, Native American tribes, about okay. 500. So I'm giving kind of Five. an overview Ooh. of some common okay. themes. Okay. Uh, but in many times, the animals are the first creations. Um, in the Hopi, they believe, and here's a, a pottery reproduction of that, that the duck was the first animal and was out there floating on the sea by itself. Oh, okay. And the creator at this point says, um, you know, dive down, we need companions. And he brings up a little of the mud from the bottom okay. and puts it on a turtle's back or in sometimes it's a muskrat that does this and this creates the world. Ooh, okay. So very often the animals um, are part of creation and, and this will vary from tribe to tribe and um, also because they're created first they are wise. Mm -hmm. They are often teachers to the later created two-legged or oh. humans. And so they're often teachers, they're often gift givers to people. Um, for example, woodpeckers um, teach a, a very shy young man uh, as he listens to the wood whistling through uh, the boughs uh, how to create a flute, a love flute, to court young, a, a young maiden that he's enamored <laughs> with. And, and, um, in other places, uh, like a story I'll tell later, Grandmother Spider, who, who I'm wearing here on this gorget, okay. and that is a Mississippian uh, Indian piece, which is what we'll see at Wycliffe Mounds. Uh, she often is a great teacher of the people. The animals often help create or create different things mm -hmm. on Earth. Okay, now, what, what's this four worlds? Okay, the four worlds. Uh, this is, is primarily uh, from the culture we're being talking about at Wycliffe. Okay. Um, but it's, it's somewhat prevalent in some of the later historic cultures. Uh, the underworld is uh, sometimes under the water, sometimes under the earth. And, and that's a place of creativity and chaos both. And, and we'll often have animals such as uh, snakes living okay. there and sometimes we'll have monsters living there and uh, these animals are sometimes frightening but they're also important in, in creating things. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, then we get to the world that we're living on Okay. and we'll have animals like possum, uh, we'll have um, Animals like frogs that can go between different worlds. They can go from the water world. They can go to the land right. world. Uh, animals that can burrow down against snakes are, are particularly important. They're often sacred 
animals. Okay. We have the sky world, where of course we have a lot of birds. Okay. And we have a lot of owls, uh, crows, all these animals. Birds are always important in most cultures because they're often messengers to God and messengers from God. Okay. So birds are very important. And then the last world is the world above, well, what we might call heaven. Okay. Um, the world we're, we're going to travel to after death. And again, sometimes we have animals accompanying us there. Sometimes we have a dog who's going along to guide us or to let us in to this world. Oh. Uh, sometimes we have a crow that's helping us through this world. And so that, that's our, our last world there. Okay, now go back over and name the four worlds for me. Okay, we have the underworld. The underworld, okay. Then we have the earth world. Okay. Uh, then we have the sky world. And, and then we have the upper world above the sky okay. that we can't see. Is there any animal that goes through all four worlds? Well, let's, <laughs> let's think. <laughs> I mean, it just occurred to me. I mean, that's okay. I don't think there's any that can make it through all, all four. The world. Okay. There's a lot. Like I said, birds are particularly important because, you know, they can go through the sky world. They can come I down gotcha. and roost. I don't think there's any that can go all the way through, but I, way through. I may be missing one. That's okay. And, and in some, the, the dog is the, the one that greets you in heaven? Uh, oftentimes a dog is one that's a guardian of certain gates and uh, hopefully you've lived a good life and the dog lets you through. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. I gotcha. Uh, <laughs> often it's a crow who okay. might go along mm -hmm. with you or, or even an owl. Uh, if you think of what animal <laughs> better to lead you through the darkness into the That's light right. than an, an owl, owl that can fly okay. through. So often it's an owl that might accompany you and that may be one reason we find so many owl pieces of pottery. We don't know, but that's a it's a good educated guess. I got okay. it. Well, uh, t we're just wow. beginning to scratch the surface, <laughs> I'll tell you. That's just fascinating what the uh, what you're telling us about all of this, Jerry. And but right now we want to take a short break and we have a forget-me-not story today. This is about Garfield, a male tabby, orange tabby cat, and uh, in honor of Garfield we have this story today, so give a listen. As a timid and introverted child, I had limited experience with cats. They would let me pet them, but sometimes they would bite or scratch without warning, not to mention the watery eyes and runny nose that always followed. Needless to say, cats weren't my favorite animal. That is, until a year and a half ago when Garfield came to my door. Garfield was a stray orange tabby with a floppy ear. I started letting him in the house little by little. He stayed outside in the day when I was at work, but came inside at night. He would always come by and meow. He really liked to talk. He never jumped on my furniture except his recliner. I did chase him around the house once when I saw him hanging from the side of a canary cage, though. My allergies were tamed by giving him frequent foam baths, which he seemed to enjoy, and I even got him neutered and vaccinated. Sadly, one day he just became weak. He no longer wanted to go outside and he would often hide from me. I decided I should take him to the vet. My neighbor was kind enough to take him for me and I remember his last little meow and sigh. Unfortunately, it was too late. Garfield was only four years old. I still to this day have no idea what happened, but Garfield endeared himself to me and he is truly missed. He passed away on April 8th of this year and is buried amongst the flowers in my backyard. May he rest in peace in God's hands. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed that uh, wonderful forget-me-not story, and thanks to uh, Terry Richards for providing that to us. And just and Terry was uh, years ago a person that was not uh, an animal person. He is <laughs> yes. now. He is now, and so uh, yes, he, he certainly and is. And we certainly appreciate Terry giving Garfield such a good home, uh, even though it was uh, for Garfield's little short life. Yeah. So. Absolutely. And we're uh, back talking with uh, uh, Jerry Marshall this afternoon. And, and Jerry, you have mentioned a, a little bit ago about a story called Grandmother Spider Brings Fire. Fire. And you're going to, through puppets, going to tell us this tell story. Tell us that story. That's one of the things that, that you do best. Right. Uh, is telling stories. <laughs> okay. So okay. we're ready. So we're listening. Okay. In the early days, when only the animal tribes had been created, the four-legged and the six-legged and the eight-legged, the people, the animal people, 
decided that they would like fire. They had no fire, they had no sun, and only they could see in the distance a glimmer of fire from the land of the fire people. So Brother Wolf called all the animals together and he said, if I had a volunteer to go over to the land of the fire people and bring back a little bit of fire, we too could have fire. We could cook our food, we could be warm, we could have light. Well, the first volunteer was Brother Buzzard. Now, Brother Buzzard in those days did not look as he does today. In those days, he was a beautiful color of turquoise blue, and he had magnificent plumes on top of his head. He was very proud of himself. Well, he came forward and he said, I will go to the land of the fire people and bring back fire. Well, all the animals nodded because if anybody could do it, it was magnificent brother buzzard. So he flew over on his um, magnificent wings and he dipped down quickly and he got some fire in his beak. Oh, it was hot. He thought, where can I hide this? Oh, I know, I'll hide it in the plumes on my head. So he hid it there and of course it burned all those beautiful feathers off. And not only that, but it caused him to turn a sooty color. And that is how he looks today. Well, he flew back and he said, no one can bring back fire. It is impossible. But Brother Wolf was not quite ready to give up. So he asked again for a volunteer. Well, the animals looked about a bit doubtful, but Brother Possum came forward with his sidekick, Brother Mole. Now, Brother Possum did not look as he does today. He had a magnificent bushy tail. Oh, he was so proud of it. He swished forward. He said, my sidekick, Brother Mole, will dig me a tunnel to the land of the fire people and I will bring back fire. That's what happened. He followed behind as Brother Mole dug. He came up, he grabbed some fire. Oh, it was hot. And he thought, where can I hide it? I know, I'll put it in my tail. Well, of course, it burned that beautiful tail, and that's why Brother Possum looks as he does today. Now, he came back and said, that's impossible. And they asked for one more volunteer. And Grandmother Spider in the very back said, I'll do it. She went through the tunnel, and she formed a little pot. She grabbed that fire, she put it in there, she came back and brought fire to the people. Now as she did, a little spark flew out and the sun was created, a little spark flew out and the moon was created, and she had been very wise. That worked. <laughs> How precious. Oh, that is, that is <laughs> Well, I good. sure, I can tell we're running out of time. There's a, I usually say in, <laughs> which I can do if you want. Okay. Uh, and so Grandmother Spider succeeded where no one else had. She invented pottery. She brought back fire. She helped the Creator put the sun and moon in the sky all in one day. And the moral to this story is you should always listen to little old ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is a wonderful story, Jerry. Oh, how precious, Jerry. Uh -oh. Jerry, I know you specialize in this kind of uh, storytelling and writing. If our viewers wanted more information about uh, these kinds of stories and all, do you ha uh, what is the website uh, that they could go to oh, to dear. get more information? I gave you the card that has the website. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it's uh, www.kentuckyspot.com. Mm -hmm. Uh, slash what? Uh, Mona Gale. Mona Gale. Slash. slash Jerry. Jerry. G E R R Y. All right. Now let's let's repeat the first part. It's www. Kentucky Spot. K Y S P O T. Right. right. Okay. Isn't there a dot com in there? Uh, there has to be. Is there a dot com in that? Yes, I believe at yeah, the very dot com yeah. slash Mona Gale 
slash Jerry. Jerry, okay. And you're, you're, you, you said you give out your email. Yes, and, and that is G-U-T-F-R-E-U-N-D-1-5 at hotmail.com. Okay. Um, I do school visits and, and I can, um, you can find on the website information on some of my books and stories. Oh, wonderful. Uh, where, where do you get the background for like the story you just told us? Um, I get it from different sources. Um, I do a lot of uh, researching, um, have quite a library of mythology books. I have also talk to other storytellers, and every storyteller has their own version that they eventually mm -hmm. put together. <laughs> and so this is my version of the Grandmother Brings Back Fire story. Well, I tell you something, I know I can identify because I know how smart animals are. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, you know, and uh, just one last comment before we take a break. Okay. Um, telling stories is one of the wonderful customs that our Native Americans have passed on from generation to generation. Very true. And uh, it's something that, uh, it's a very rich lore than, uh, Absolutely. and such. So anyway, we would like to take a short break now okay. and do listen to another Forget Me Not Today. This is about a Brittany Spaniel named Sammy. Sammy. She was a very special dog and uh, in fact, she was one of our grand she, dogs. That's right. <laughs> so, Hope the viewers will enjoy this story, so let's give a listen. Sammy was a female Brittany Spaniel that became part of the Buffo family in 1996. She was a very special dog. She was curious about many things and loved being outside. Although we never took her hunting, which Brittany's are known for, her size and curiosity would have made her an excellent hunting dog. As she got older, she never seemed to slow down and loved to play catch, especially with Alex and Nick. Her favorite activity was to ride in the car. Unfortunately, she passed away in 2009, but Sammy gave us lots of joy and love, and we truly miss her. We know she's with God, and she has a happy forever home. Welcome back. We hope that you enjoyed that wonderful story about Sammy. She was a very special dog to the Buffaloes, and we would like to thank them for sharing that story with us. And as I said, she, she was one of our grand dogs. So. And we would like to thank the Buffo family. They made a donation in honor of Sammy to Wayside Waves, and this is in the Kansas City area. Mm -hmm. And uh, Terry uh, made a donation, I believe it was, to one of our local. Uh, Paws, Claws, and more. Paws, Claws, and more of Mayfield. Right. And, uh, we, we appreciate uh, the care that both these families gave to these two animals and to the donations that they have made yes. uh, in their honor. Yes. And as we'll see a little bit later, but we'll just mention it now. We'd like to dedicate the show today to both Garfield yes, and Sammy. That's right, in and, their memory. And also, just a reminder, viewers, that if you have a story, a forget me not, or even a happy tale, um, contact many us. Of you contact us. You can call me at 443-8330 or email me at greg underscore bauer at comcast.net. All right. We were just having a fascinating uh, session oh, this yes, afternoon we are. With, with Jerry Marshall who's program specialist at Wycliffe Mound State Historical Park. And Jerry, you mentioned something in a little earlier segment. Let's uh, go to that and talk about what do you mean by the Mississippian culture? Okay, uh, the Mississippian culture was actually largely all over the eastern part of the United States, um, as far as Wisconsin, Ohio, Kentucky, down to the Gulf. Uh, it, um, it was a, a culture that um, was, had a lot of art and they did not leave us a written word. Mm -hmm. Wycliffe Mounds is the only state uh, archeological site open to the public and it is a Mississippian village. Uh, culture existed back to about 1100, Wycliffe Mounds to about 1350, the whole Mississippian culture to around 1500. Okay. And what, what do we know about this culture? Well, one thing that uh, most people notice, they are a mound building culture. Uh, they would build uh, several types of mounds, burial mounds being one, uh, ceremonial mounds being, being another. 
uh, mounds where the chief's house would have sat. And I always like to point out that chief could have been a man or a woman when I give <laughs> school tours. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, they did a great bit of symbolic pottery. I have uh, several examples here of reproduction pottery uh, made by my dear friend Fane, and who is also a program specialist at Wycliffe mm -hmm. Mounds. And he does this the way the Mississippian people would have done. Okay. And as you'll notice, a lot of these do have different animal effigies, an effigy being uh, something that's represented uh, mm -hmm. in, in a piece of art. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and so we have, I've referred to some of them before, our, our most known are probably owls. Uh, we have a lot of owls we found at Wycliffe Mounds. You can see this one here, there's one here, and this one here would have been attached to a pipe. Oh, um, okay. So, uh, again, I talked a little earlier about, you know, that we know owls are important. Um, in some cultures, they're quite frightening. In others, they're quite wise. And since they left us a, a no written language, we can kind of guess. <laughs> but uh, we can consider they were probably messengers and, again, you know, might have helped people through death. Um, mm -hmm. But we uh, have a number of those. We also find a lot of ducks. Um, and birds, and of course these, as well as farming cultures, grew corn or maize, uh, were hunters. And so we often see effigies of ducks as well, and we see a great many different animals in their, in their pottery that they left behind for us. And also in their pendants are really officially called gorgets. Uh, we again see grandmother spider, we have woodpecker, we have a great many different animals that show up in this culture. I know that one of the things, since we're in the area right now close to the Mississippi River, uh, one of the things we see uh, uh, in terms of birds, uh, we see an awful lot of eagles. And the eagle was a, is a very sacred bird to the Native Americans. In, in a it? number of cultures, yes, the eagles were. Uh, we see that a little bit more out in the Western cultures. Okay. Uh, Native Americans are actually the only people that can own an eagle feather for ritual purposes. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. What would you say would be the, the more sacred animals in our area and maybe what are the sacred animals that might be in the West um, or in different areas of the and, U.S.? And again, this is really going to vary greatly okay. by, by tribe, um, but um, again, owls um, are, are considered often wolves, okay. bear, uh, we've talked about turtles. Um, as we, as we go further west, there's often a, a trickster character who's kind of like what we might call a holy fool, who, who does foolish things, but in doing those, teaches great lessons. In, in uh, Eastern culture, that tends to often be a rabbit. In Western, it tends to be a coyote. Uh, so we see uh, some correlation there. Um, and as we get northwest, we see, you know, animals up there. A salmon are considered especially oh, really? uh, sacred uh, in the northwest. Okay. Deer in our area. Okay. Now, if we wanted to get more information about, like, the Wycliffe uh, mounds, right. what would be a contact, uh, um, maybe a telephone number? I think the best thing to do would be to call them. Uh, we do offer school tours, and of course you can come visit. And their number is 270-335-3681. And uh, you can find out hours. And if you would want to schedule a, a school tour, a Girl Scout, Boy Scout oh, wonderful. tour, mm -hmm. uh, they can tell you that. And, and possibly Fane or I would, would be the ones helping you. Well, in our last minute, tell <laughs> us, what, what one thing would you like our viewers to remember about animals in Native, in Native American cultures? I, I think the important thing to realize is there are many Native Americans still, of course, a, a vibrant people, but in our area we have built on their land, and so we need to respect the land and the animals, animals. that mm -hmm. inhabit it mm -hmm. and uh, take care of them. And Couldn't be said any better. No, it could not be. <laughs> and Jerry, we would like to thank you so much for joining us today and uh, bringing us an awful lot of wonderful thoughts and a lot of good information. So And sharing her time and talents absolutely, with us. As absolutely. It has been a, uh, really um, an interesting uh, show. And, and I learned welcome. an awful lot. I so, have to. In closing. I'm Angie. 
And Darlene. <laughs> and I'm Greg, and with Wicket here, wanting our viewers to remember what we say every time. Give your pet a little extra love today and, and every, every day. day. See you next time. Bye.